like Augustine's Confessions, Dante's comedy charts a retrospective, introspective, and prospective movement throughout the poem, which corresponds to the ways in which history, allegory, ontology, and theology overlap and intertwine. Let's see, let's go to the next. In assuming the role of Scriba Dei, Dante makes the Commedia a progressive revelation of his understanding of divine providence as he comes closer to the truth of the universe and the unfolding of eternal love. Beatrice's explanation in Paradiso 7 of how divine love, a love that renews the world, inspired the incarnation, radically alters the terms by which humans might understand the destiny of history and their purpose in it. This motif of love continues into Paradiso 8, the first canto of the heaven of Venus, but it also had been visible in Purgatorio 8, although mostly missing in Inferno 8. Thus, there is a symmetry among these cantos in the vertical reading of the poem, but there is also a narrative conceptual progression the increasing knowledge and understanding on the part of the pilgrim alongside the poet's self-revelation constitutes the hermeneutical principle for exploring these three cantos as interrelated. Focusing on the eighth cantos of the Commedia, I will begin with Paradiso VIII and retrospectively connect its concerns, persons, and intellectual inquiries to those of Purgatorio Eight and Inferno Eight. I will argue that Paradiso Eight occupies itself with the core issues of the poem and highlights the poem's ideological unity as it probes the source of human corruption and of love and the connection of these to civitas, that is, to citizenship, membership in a community, and the freedom of citizens. As such, it offers a stark contrast with the civil rancor that enters the poem vehemently in Inferno 8, although the ideals of friendship featured in Purgatorio 7 and 8 hint at the benefits of civic amity that Paradiso 8 celebrates. But before delving into the heart of this discussion, let me just sort of briefly go back over what these cantos have in common, what the parallelisms are. So the ninth cantos are often considered thresholds to the domains proper of the respective canticles. Certainly, Inferno 9 dramatizes the entrance to Dis, that is, hell proper, and Pur Purgatory 9, the entrance to Purgatory. We have gates to cities here, and someone has got to open them. But the eighth cantos so carefully <clears throat> and tightly linked by themes, events, politics, and philosophical issues with both the seventh and ninth cantos might well be considered the first phases of these thresholds. In fact, the threshold to Dis does indeed occur in Inferno 8, when Virgil and Dante are barred from entering, as these, our adversaries, shut the gates. Purgatory 8, on the other hand, opens with a magnificent six-line simile expressing nostalgia for home and likening the time of day to the sailor yearning for home and the pilgrim who hears the bells of his home from afar as they mourn the passing of the day. The simile informs us that the first day of purgatory is reaching nightfall, a precursor to the first dream of the poem that will transport the pilgrim to the gates of purgatory in the following canto. Rising into the third heaven in Paradiso 8 is so natural for Dante that he doesn't even notice the transition, except for the fact that Beatrice is increasing in beauty, and that makes him realize he is in the heaven of Venus. Structurally and rhetorically, all three cantos use a form of rhetorical enjambement to link Canto 7, 8, and 9, in which the beginning flows into the, from the previous canto and the end to the following. For example, Inferno 8 has the enigmatic opening 
io dico seguitando, I say continuing, that led to the theory that Dante had written the first seven cantos before the exile from Florence and was now returning to the poem. Inferno 8 really does not end because Virgil is rebuffed at the gates and Inferno 9 opens with Virgil turning back towards the pilgrim. Purgatorio 7 ends with Sordello's long speech on all the residents of the Valley of Princes, with 8 then telling us the time, that it's dusk, it was now the hour, and ending with Curado's prophecy of Dante's exile, while 9 begins by telling us that in Purgatory it was nearly three hours after sunset. This kind of rhetorical enjambment is not apparent between Paradiso 7 and 8, although the, the main theme of Paradiso 7, divine love, most definitely continues. Enjambment makes Paradiso 8 run into 9, which continues the exchange between Carlo Martello and the pilgrim. All three cantos form a triptych that deals specifically with love, free will, and divine providence. In terms of dramaturgy, clearly inspirational to artists, if we were to generalize, the Canto Sevens are essentially static, talk and philosophic discourse as question and answer dominate most definitely in Inferno Seven despite its howling voices. In Paradiso Seven, Beatrice alone speaks for most of the canto, and Purgatorio Seven's Garden of Repose is a static locus amenus. The Canto Eights, on the other hand, are replete with action and movement. Inferno Eight, for example, features Fledges' boat running swiftly through the air like an arrow, his angry shouting, Filippo Argenti rancorously trying to pull Dante into the muddy waters with him, Virgil and Dante both expressing rage against Filippo, the other sinners attacking Filippo, the jeering fallen angels scorning Dante. I'm going to just run through these. It's clearly very inspirational to artists, as you can see, uh, from the very beginning, I might add. Um, uh, the jeering fallen angels scorning Dante and sending him on his way, and the drama between Dante and Virgil before the closed gates of Dis, a moment of crisis so severe that the pilgrim loses trust in his guide's reliability. I remain in doubt, as yes and no contend within my head. The canto ends with the devil slamming the city gates in Virgil's face, while Virgil, shorn of all boldness, must await divine intervention. This canto on the threshold of the city of disorder that is hell stresses the rancor that rules a failed and corrupt society even if it efficiently achieves its ends. Purgatorio 8 has a similar range of action, beginning with a praying spirit who is singing the Te Lucis Ante, and joined by all the other souls, the group of five, Virgil, Dante, Sordello, Nino, and Curado, see two angels descend from heaven to guard the valley. The pilgrims' exchanges with Judge Nino and Curado are interrupted by a liturgical drama or sacred representation. Paradiso 8 is less theatrical than Inferno and Purgatorio 8. Nonetheless, it brings together Beatrice's increasing beauty, the glittering, dancing, singing lights, the joyful singing of Hosanna, and the generous greeting spoken by Carlo Martello for everyone, tutti sempresti. Carlo's exchange with Dante expresses a copious emotional range, from loving recognition to nostalgia and regret, to an indictment of his family, and finally, philosophical discourse. As Benedetto Croce noted, together these details make Paradiso VIII one of the more dramatic cantos of the canticle. Now to discuss the themes and issues as explored vertically. First, all three deal with some aspect of Dante's personal, local, and dare I say, provincial Florentine history and contemporary historical persons and events. Inferno VIII presents Filippo Argente, a Florentine of the Arimari family, condemned by Cacciaguida later in Paradiso, 
who allegedly benefited from Dante's exile. Purgatorio VIII brings Florence together with fellow Tuscans and pan-European figures. Guelphs and Ghibellines find companionship with the appearance of Nino Visconti, grandson of Count Ugolino, who's in Inferno 33, a staunch member of, that is, Ugolino is not a staunch member of the Guelph party, but Nino, who supported the Florentine Guelphs against his Ghibelline-ruled city of Pisa, and Conrad Malaspina, whose family would help Dante in exile, and according to Boccaccio, a Ghibelline. Finally, Carlo Martello, the <coughs> central figure of Paradiso VIII, though not named, was in Florence in 1294 for a visit, according to Villani, lasting 20 days and in which he was treated with great honor and during which time we are led to believe he and Dante met. Carlo Martello was married, here's a little bit of history, my husband said it's very boring, but I'm going to tell it to you anyway. <laughs> Carlo Martello was married to Clemens of Hungary, daughter of Emperor Rulo I, whom Sordello names among the negligent rulers. There are close links between this branch of the Angevin dynasty and Florence's history. The oldest son of Maria of Hungary and the Angevin king, Charles II, king of Naples and Provence, Carlo was crowned King of Hungary in 1292. He was heir to Provence and the Kingdom of Naples that had extended to Sicily until the Sicilian Vespers in 1282, lost due to his grandfather Charles I's a Guelph, he too amongst the negligent rulers. Charles I, as King of Sicily and Naples as, and as Imperial Vicar of Italy, was Podesta of Florence for 12 years creating a set of alliances that united most of the Italian peninsula. So you can see there are some very heavy local politics here. Uh, about his son, Charles II, the father of Carlo Martello, Sordello says, as much is the plant inferior to its seed, thus presenting a genealogy of kings that goes from modestly good, Carlo I, to bad, Carlo II, to ideal, Carlo Martello. Connected to this issue of local and pan-European history is a, cons a concern both implicit and explicit with civic life, politics, and friendships evident in all three cantos. The bellicose atmosphere of Inferno VIII vividly demonstrates civil strife, one of the consequences of the rage punished in the muddy waters of the Styx. Virgil and Sordello's demonstration of civic amity across 1,300 years celebrated in Purgatorio VI and Purgatorio VII foreshadows the friendly encounters of Purgatorio VIII and contrast with the diatribe against Italy of Purgatorio VI. With Virgil and Sordello keeping company for three cantos, six through eight, we see fraternal love and solicitude, virtues that unite citizens. And in Purgatorio VIII, we witness contemporary examples of civic friendship, Dante, Nino Visconti, and Conrad Malaspina. Carlo Martello's much commented, commented on greeting to Dante in Paradiso VIII as the first of a wave of joyous souls to follow provides spirited evidence of civil society. We are already at your pleasure that you may have joy of us. His greeting contrasts radically with the slammed doors of Inferno VIII. Another issue raised in all three cantos, partially because of the attention to public figures linked to Florence's recent history, is the question of kingship and whether and why virtue does or does not run in families. This leads to a question that Dante implicitly raises throughout the poem, that is, how good parents can bear bad children, or bad parents, good children. Carlo Martello, with his own genealogy, a demonstration of this pattern, addresses this question. Tied to this and at the core of the philosophical issues of Paradiso VIII is the power of planets, the role of free will, nature, and love, 
and the connection of these three to the task of living in a civil society. One final aspect that all three cantos share is the significant presence of angels. In Inferno 8, the fallen angels become the first to halt the progress of Dante and Virgil's journey forward. Virgil, who stuns all the figures from his own epic pagan past, Charon, Minas, Cerberus, Plutus, and Phlegius, the icon of the age, proves impotent against the fallen angels. It takes an act of grace in the form of an angel to open the gates. So we have, there's the angel. This is, of course, in Inferno 9, and that's Blake. Uh, for Dante Pilgrim at this point, there's no going back, except in a recidivist spiral backward. The Pilgrim must descend to the depths, and Virgil's inadequacy here in the spiritual journey has been amply addressed by many commentators. The fallen angels, the first intelligences to create discord in the universe, are guardians over the disordered city. They constitute a threat not just to the pilgrims' advance forward, but hover as essences of civic envy, enmity, and cosmic rupture. By contrast, in Purgatorio 8, two angels, colored green like the environment as a sign of hope and with blunt swords, appear at nighttime to safeguard the princely penitents who are singing the Te Luches a prayer that asks the creator to guard and protect them at night. With an address to the reader, Dante reminds us to sharpen our eyes, although it should be easy to see beyond the veil. The angel's presence proves necessary when a counter mask or sacred representation of the events that first brought rapture to the world in Eden threatens the peaceful environment. The angels chase away our adversary, the mask constituting a performance of the prayer and a vivid demonstration of the power of the theological virtue of hope. In Paradiso 8, the souls, Carlo Martello tells us, circle with a cluster of angels, the Principi Celesti, the angels who move the heaven of Venus in the convivio attributed to the thrones. As the heaven of rhetoric, Venus is associated with political order just as are the principalities in the order of the angels. That Dante changes which angels move the heaven of Venus from his earlier work reinforces the political theme of Paradiso 8. So let's take a look at what Pseudo-Dionysus, who Thomas Aquinas uh, follows in this matter, has to say about the celestial hierarchy. It remains now to contemplate that final rank in the hierarchy of angels. I mean the godlike principalities, archangels and angels. The term heavenly principalities refers to those who possess a godlike and princely hegemony with a sacred order most suited to princely powers, the ability to be returned completely toward the principle which is above all principles, and to lead others to him like a prince. The power to receive to the full the mark of the principle of principles, and by their harmonious exercise of princely powers, to make manifest this transcendent principle of all order. Thomas Aquinas specifically states that this third angelic order, the principalities, commands human hierarchies because in human affairs, there is a common good, which is in fact the good of the state or a people. It falls to this order of angels to instruct leaders among men. Not counting Henry VII, whose presence in heaven is promised in Paradiso 31, Carlo Martello is the only ruler in Dante's lifetime the poet includes in Paradiso. Speaking as noi, in other words, as a community, Carlo informs Dante Pilgrim immediately that he travels with these celestial principalities. Dante Poet here, therefore, is making Carlo Martello a figura of the ideal ruler, 
as a prince most suited to the harmonious exercise of princely powers. I will return to that later in the paper. So now Paradiso 8. It opens with a magnificent 12-line <clears throat> description and history of La Bella Ciprinia, the goddess named Planet that the ancients in their ancient era honored. The exordium introduces the dichotomy that structures Charles Martel's speech, love that destroys versus love that creates civic unity and order. It addresses the ancient era that folle amore is caused by Venus and her blind son, and it is not off the mark to see how this provides a retrospective lens whereby to read Inferno 8 and Purgatorio 8. The world was wont to believe to its peril that the fair Cyprian, wheeling in the third epicycle, rayed down mad love, wherefore the ancient people in their ancient era not only to her did honor with sacrifice and votive cry, but they honored Dione and Cupid, the one as mother, the other as her son, and they told that he had sat in Dido's lap, and from her with whom I take my start, they took the name of the star which the sun woos, now behind her, now before. Initially, one might think these lines are merely meant to introduce the heaven of Venus, the star that the sun, as the source of love, woos. But in fact, what Dante achieves here is an indictment of the pagan world. While adopting Latinisms, Periclo, for example, and echoes of ancient poetry from Ovid and Virgil to characterize the ancient people, he rhymes Dido with Cupido and Grido to highlight the era both in the Virgilian narrative of the mad love of Dido and the perilous belief that humans have no freedom. Dante Pilgrim had raised the issue of the role of the stars as suggested in Plato's Timaeus, also in Paradiso IV, only to be roundly chastised by Beatrice, who showed him the defects in both pl Platonic and Averroistic thinking on this point. Again here in Paradiso VIII, the problem of the influence of the stars as appears. As Falani wrote, the theme of the planets and their influences on human affairs constitutes the argument that disciplines the discussion. Dante here detaches the planet Venus from its ancient lore, and in so doing reminds us of Virgil's limitations, made so evident in Inferno VIII when the fallen angels bar his passage. Similarly, in Purgatorio VIII, it is not Virgil who can protect the pilgrim at night, but the angels who guard the valley. And in the following canto, it is Lucy, not Virgil, who lifts him to Purgatory proper. In these instances, we have Christian grace and free will pitted against ancient fatalism a redeemed Venus over the Venus of disorderly desire. In putting all the verbs in the past, except Pilio, which Dante contrasts with Piliavano, he condemns the ancient era, but he takes Venus's name to contrast this dangerous pagan view of Venus, the Venus of Folle Amore, with, as Dante writes in Paradiso I, the love that rules the heavens and as he writes in the last line of the poem, the love that moves the sun and the other stars, the apotheosis of the love that renews life. This introduces a critical concern of the heaven of Venus, already elaborated as the reason for the incarnation in Paradiso 7, and explored now in Paradiso 8 and 9. In fact, Paradiso 8 will focus on what Dante considers the more important features of Venus under the influence of the principalities and the art of rhetoric. Here he will address the natural order of the universe, that is, the nature of human diversity, providence, and the love between creator and creatures as the motor that moves the universe. This love, 
by the citizens together in contrast to the immoderate desires of individuals who shatter the common good. As the Lumi Divini and a polyphonic luminescent splash of unity approach, one of them, Solo, welcomes Dante. He informs them that they, as one, all travel with the principalities, addressing Dante with the first line of the, fourth, of the first canzone of the convivio, with one circle, with one circling, and with one thirst, we revolve with the celestial princes to whom you in the world once did say you move the third heaven by intellection. Two separate palinodes of Dante's early work occur here. First, as pointed out above, in the convivio, he attributed the movement of Venus to the thrones, whereas here it is to the principalities. Second, in this canzone, Dante had stated that Venus, il terzo ciel, was responsible for the state in which he found himself. The heaven that follows your power drags me into the state where I am. The speaker in Paradiso 8, however, Carlo Martello, while quoting from Dante's poem, will address specifically that humans are in charge of their own affairs and not the stars. Furthermore, as the third and final self-citation of earlier poetry in the Commedia, it serves as a palinodic reference to the false assumptions of the convivio. All three of Dante's self-citations of his lyric poetry concern love and divine truth, and this third citation introduces the Venus that Dante adopts in Carlo Martello's discourse. This is not the Venus of selfish love, the sensual love or cupidity that had destroyed Dido and Francesca. But the Venus, as Carlo Martello puts it, my love more than the leaves. This love creates unity and harmony with the power to receive, it's a quote from Pseudo Dionysus, the, the, to the full, the mark of the principle of principles and by their harmonious exercise of princely powers to make man manifest this transcendent principle of all order, just as the angels who move the third heaven. Carlo Martello's segment of the canto, which is 31 through 148, can be divided into two sections that include a corollario. In the first part, the Angevin prince introduces himself by recalling his meeting with Dante and his official role as bearer of the crown of that land which the Danube waters after it has left its German banks. The second part, 85 to 148, responds to Dante's question about the stars and the limits of their influence on human behavior with the specific corollary about how human freedom is contravened by human force. The exchange with Carlo Martello parallels that with Filippo Argenti and with Nino Visconti and Corrado Malaspino, uh, Malaspina in Purgatorio. As pointed out above, all are associated with recent Florentine politics and with the historic Dante in some way. Filippo is an exemplum of unregulated and unjustified rage, matched with Dante's and Virgil's angry response to him on which scholars have spilled much ink. Important for our vertical readings of the canto is Filippo's role as exemplary of the individual rage that creates civic disorder, a rage so potent that it symbolically, that symbolically it would pull all into the stagnant waters with it, including Dante and Virgil. The only hint of the love that binds in Inferno VIII is when Virgil acts in approbation. Then he put his arms about my neck, kissed my face, and said, indignant soul, blessed is she who bore you. If Dante poet confined himself to historical veracity, Virgil could not know that he was citing Luke 11.27, spoken by Jesus, spoken to Jesus by a woman in a crowd, but also corrected by Jesus, telling her, blessed are those who hear the word of God and keep it. 
Hawkins argues that the misappropriated citation also demonstrates Virgil's limitations, which indeed may be true, but the quotation alongside Virgil's display of affection also conveys the loving bond between the two poets, the only hint of unselfish love in the canto. Purgatorio VIII, contrasting with Filippo's rage, continues this display of affection when Dante meets Nino Visconti in an exchange which demonstrates, which demonstrates civic amity and mutual pleasure. The pilgrim is joyful to find Nino. How I rejoice to see you there and not among the damned, and not among the damned. And Nino, for his part, no fair salutation silent between us, greets the pilgrim. How long is it since you came to the foot of the mountain? Nino, as grandson of Count Ugolino, punished with the traitors in Inferno 33, raises that implicit question about virtues in families, just as Carlo Martello's family history. The second encounter continues this theme of civic amity. Although Dante did not know Corrado Malaspina, who died in 1294, he was a guest of the Malaspina family in 1306 and uses this occasion to praise the family, known throughout Europe for its generosity and gallantry. More particularly, Dante praises the family because it alone goes right and scorns the evil part, even when the wicked head turn the world awry, themes that will reoccur in Paradiso VIII. Following the Laudatio, Corrado prophesies Dante's coming exile, and in contrast to Filippo Argenti, who is reputed to have despoiled Dante of what wealth he had possessed following the poet's exile, he promises that Dante's opinion of the family will be proven true. Dante's meeting with Carlo Martello continues these themes with Dante's status as exul in meritus, linking Corrado's prophecy with Carlo's spontaneous and regretful, for had I remained below, I would have shown you of my love more than the leaves. The first section of Carlo Martello's speech following his citation of the, of the convivio we are so full of love that in order to please you, a little quiet will not be less sweet to you. Specific contrasts have been drawn between this wave of lovers who leave the circle of the seraphim to stop and talk with Dante and Paolo and Francesca's brief escape from La Schiera Obedido in Inferno V. This becomes yet another occasion to contrast the folle amore of Venus that opens the canto with the divine love that Carlo Martello immediately declares to the pilgrim of whom Carlo says, you loved me much. Like Virgil's reference to the early death of Marcellus in the Aeneid, who follows, what follows expresses a nostalgic and melancholic sense of the loss of the young prince, a result of inexplicable fortune whose generosity and talents might have unified Southern Europe, <clears throat> much of Southern Europe. Carlo's expression of regret about what might have been if an early death had not prevented it conveys the ill that is still to follow his demise. The world held me below but little time, he says, and had it been more, much ill shall be that would not have been. Carlo's geographic description of the political realms that he would have inherited if he had not died so young include a hint that he would have restored Sicily to the kingdom of Naples. Such a political realm promised to unify what would have been Hungary, Provence, and the kingdom of Naples. At the same time, Carlo chastises his brother who had inherited his place after his death for avarice, thereby, of course, allowing Dante once again to further indict the Capetian and Angevin lineage, already so scathingly exposed for avarice by Sordello in Purgatorio VII and in Purgatorio XX by the founder of the dynasty, Ugo Capetto. 
Carlo Martello as a leader of the Lumi Divini, who are full of love and emanating from the potentates who reflect the divine entity onto the leaders of the world, emerges here very clearly as the exemplum, the figura of the monarch, the utopian monarch specifically described in the monarchia. Usually, and I wouldn't deny that, um, attributed to a description of what Henry VII might have been. Justice is at its strongest in the world when it resides in a subject who has, in the highest degree possible, the will and power to act. Only the monarch is such a subject. Therefore, justice is at its strongest in the world when it is located in the monarch alone. He continues, moreover, just as greed, and actually the word is cupiditas, however slight, dulls the habit of justice in some way, so charity is rightly ordered love, makes it sharper and brighter. So the man in whom rightly ordered love can be strongest is the one in whom justice can have its principal abode. The monarch is such a man. Therefore, justice is or can be at its strongest when he exists. He has bought a jelly. Highlighting justice informed by caritas as the signature virtues of the ideal monarch as opposed to cupiditas, these passages from the Monarchia appear to comment on Carlo Martello's career as represented in Paradiso VIII. Furthermore, the trait identified in the Monarchia as the mark of an unjust ruler, cupiditas, moreover, just as greed, however slight, dulls the habit of justice in some way, connects the philosophical discussion to a concrete historical case. Carlo's great promise as a loving ruler is truncated by his early death. He is succeeded by an avaricious brother. With the pitting of caritas against cupiditas, Dante has adopted Augustinian language, but his point on the surface appears to differ radically from the learned doctor who opposes the earthly city created out of contempt for God to the heavenly city carried to the point of self-contempt. However, Augustine <laughs> elaborates that those who seek the gains of the earthly city are driven by a lust for dominion over princes and nations, for which, of course, as we all know, he had condemned the Romans. But rulers and ruled, ruled who serve one another in love bring the city of God to earth. And that's a quote from the city of God. As the career of Carlo Martello, Dante intimates, would have attempted had his early death not intervened. This historic narrative becomes Dante's occasion to ask the question, how from sweet seed may come bitter fruit, which picks up the metaphor of plant and seed used by Sordello in Purgatorio VII about Charles II, Carlo Martello's father. The second part, Paradiso 8, 85 to 148 of Carlo's speech, answers this question, which with a corollary addresses the main themes of the canto, love, providence, free will, fortune, and their connection to citizenship. Let's return to, for a moment, though, to the hierarchy of angels, because precisely following Thomas's discussion of the order of angels, he explores the question of order among men. Just as the angels have an order, and an order that connects to the divine and human order, as we are witnessing with the potentates, divine providence, Thomas writes, imposes order on all things. Humans have a natural order, those with understanding naturally suited to governance, and those with strong bodies naturally fitted for service, as Aristotle says in the politics. But disorder occurs, Thomas explains, in human government as a result of a man getting control, not because of the eminence of his understanding, but because either he usurps dominion for himself by bodily strength, or because someone is set up as a ruler on the basis of sensual affection. Thomas's main point, it seems to me, is that divine providence with the angels as agents imposes order, 
but humans force this order awry. Returning to Carlo Martello's explanation of why good seed produces bitter fruit, Carlo, who knows the truth directly from God, there where every good ends and begins, is concerned to show the pilgrim that the good which revolves and contents all the realm that you are climbing makes its providence become a power in these great bodies. And what, whatever effects are produced by these heavens, infused as they are with the perfect mind, the primal intelligence cannot be less than perfect, because if God were not directing this order, the result would be, as Dante writes, pardon me, so 8108, ruins. The pilgrim quickly agrees with this statement, because to contradict it would make the divinity defective. But then, of course, from whence does civil and moral disorder emanate? Rather than an immediate answer, we get Carlo Martello's question that goes back to the core of the philosophical question of the canto and has an equal importance to the entire ideological structure of the poem. Would it be worse for man on earth if he were not a citizen? Chive. Of course, the pilgrim is certain that it would be worse and asks for no proof. Man of necessity must be part of a larger society, not a party to himself. Dante uses this Latinism, chive, only twice in the poem, here sanctioning the earthly destiny of man, and in the first citation referring to Dante's ultimate destiny as a citizen of the city of God. Carlo Martello continues, following Aristotle and Thomas Aquinas, that divine providence excuse me, orchestrates the civil society, and it is this that requires men to have diverse duties, making one born Solon, another Xerxes, another Melchizedek, and another Daedalus, because to create a city or regnum requires such diversity. This is how nature operates. Yet there is still the problem that virtue does not run in families. Hence, Jacob and Esau, or Romulus and his base father, or Nino and his treacherous grandfather, Ugolino, or Carlo Martello and his brother and father. This Carlo proclaims in his corollary results because the world below does not follow the foundation of nature, which would make people good, and therefore produces evil results. Rather, going against nature, they twist nature. They twist nature, it's a very strong word, forcing those suited to religion to the sword, and those suited to the sword and kingly rule to religion. Carlo's point is actually demonstrated by the example of the Malaspina family featured in Purgatorio VIII, who, according to Dante, is privileged by nature and use and avoids the twisted world. In other words, civic and religious failure, whether institutional or personal, results from distorted will, that is, human arrogance, intransigence, and temerity, which together violate nature and the divinely orchestrated providence that regulates it. And this, Carlo concludes, a fuor di strada, here linking the foolish love of the beautiful Venus with the disordered politics and society of Dante's own benighted times. As the ideal monarch that Dante spells out in the Monarchia, Carlo Martello becomes the figure and voice of regal courtesy, exhibiting a sense of justice informed by love who deplores bad government without losing hope of good government. The idealized monarch knows that divine providence and love would make the people good, but miscreant will works against this divine gift. In the Canto Eights, Dante skillfully brings the affective together with the intellective, with characters exhibiting a range of emotions from the bitterness of wrath and hatred to the loving warmth of friendship and love. At the same time, through the retrospective lens of Paradiso 8, 
he brings together is scholarly speculation on the cause of civil and personal wrongdoing, tying the personal to the political, the civic to the moral, rationalism to faith, passion for civil order with divine providence, and human to transcendent love. Still, from the perspective of Carlo Martello as an ideal monarch and Paradiso VIII looking backwards, Dante leaves us with a sense of melancholy about the elusiveness of what might have been achieved in the civic domain, so vulnerable as it is to the whims of fortune and the twisted desires of humans. This ideal of what might have been contrasts with what can be, as witnessed in the show of friendship, camaraderie, and hope in Purgatorio VIII, and unfortunately with what, with what is, as performed before us by the angry and vitriolic distorted figures at the gates of this. Thank you.